All right, that should be live. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I did not realize it was also World Blender Meetup Day. So uh, yeah, <laughs> bad timing on my part, but I figured if we're all stuck at home, <clears throat> it could be fun to do a stream. And uh, I'm gonna talk about a few things today and then uh, try and create something from scratch in a series that I've been working on lately to see uh, if it's at all possible. So I don't know how long this one is gonna take, but um, we'll dive right in. Um, I'm trying this whole new fancy thing with uh, OBS as well, so um, cut me some slack if I mess up. I've been, been trying to get this all to work properly. Um, so yeah, what are we going to do today? And I'll switch over here. Um, so for the first one, I'm just going to look at uh, these images real quick, just uh, how I ended up creating them and uh, sort of the workflow behind them. Uh, there's two, and then there's another one I'll talk about a little bit later. And then for the second one, um, these, I'll actually create one of these as well from scratch so you see how they're done. Uh, and I figured it could be fun just to kind of take our time, relax, and uh, and try and create something from scratch. So with that said, let's get started and open up the first one here. Let's start with the faces. Uh, stream. And go, there we go. Ooh. Is it three or four? I'll have to check myself now. It's going to be three for that first one. Um, all right, let's see for this first one. I need to clean this up a little bit. There we go. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like uh, when we go to rendered view, you'll actually see the final result. So as you can see from the render and the image, there's actually very little post-production going on. I think the only thing I really added was a little bit of glow. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on the, the post process, but um, this is basically what it looks like. And you can kind of see uh, the shape of the face. So with this kind of thing, um, I tend to really early on uh, figure out my camera view because that way I can focus more on the lighting and uh, tweaking it for the view itself. If you don't have a camera view and you're just going to start lighting around, um, generally it's quite hard to do because you don't know how certain reflections are going to react. And you'll see um, these lights are, might look like they're in really weird positions. But as we'll see in a, in a bit, um, it's due to the shader. So uh, let's see and get uh, started. And I'll answer questions in between when, uh, when I'm answering, or I'll try to look at it a little bit, but um, I'll answer most of the questions sort of in between things. So let's kind of start from the beginning on this one and just open up a new blender just to very quickly show you how I got started on it. And of course, this doesn't have the add-on installed that I need. Typical. And it's not in here either. So let's see if we can go to Blender 282. So for the person that was asking that question, I'm using Blender 2.83 uh, most of the time. So the experimental builds. Let's see, Aha, here I have the add-on. Um, but I'll need to import gonna grab a human male, import the template, and it doesn't work because of course it doesn't. All right, let's just download the add-on for 2.83 real quick then. Uh, this should be the right one. And you can see these are all created with uh, MB Lab. So let me close this up real quick. Wait for this to finish. Time for some questions then, I guess. So um, is this some kind of tiling window manager? Nope, it's just uh, it's just XFC. So, um, but it works quite well because you can do half and quarter tiling, which is one of the reasons I really like it. Uh, so am I running the latest build? Yes, uh, I kind of I've 
tried to run a version that I compile myself nowadays because um, that seemed sort of fun to get into and see if I could get it to work. Uh, and that, I, I run it with some success, let's put it that way. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I'm learning a lot about how, um, how Blender kind of works internally, so that's kind of fun. And this doesn't work at all. All right, so let's see if we can just do it with the uh, stuff that's in here. Normally I use that add-on, but obviously it's not gonna work the moment I'm trying to do stuff. So let's see, is this the original? Come on, I wanted this to work. All right, well, let's do it slightly differently. I'll just show you the technique on a different uh, object real quick. But the same thing basically applies. So not, not a pen, we're going to import. I believe it's an OBJ, there we go. This is just a simple base mesh. I'm gonna subdivide it a whole bunch of times. Uh, so you can see Subdivided a fair bit. I think I might have subdivided a little bit more even on the final one, but for now let's just apply this, set smooth shading. And the cool thing is in uh, Blender 2.83, in sculpt mode, you've got new tools now, including the cloth tool. So this is basically the one I used to, uh, to create that effect. And uh, there's been a lot of hype about it on the internet. So let's see if we can open up the tool view here, just to look at the settings a little bit. Um, so it's a case of just trying stuff out, but you can see this generates really interesting patterns. Um, and I've got symmetry on here, we're already making something real creepy. So let's see if I turn symmetry off real quick. You can really, really push it around. And the more the mesh gets deformed, the, the more interesting it starts looking as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a multi-resolution modifier, subdivide it. And now we can get even more detail in it, but the cloth sims will be slightly slower, of course. Here you can see what's going on. It's pretty cool. And it's just a case of massaging it around and having fun with it. Like I said, sometimes I'll do these experiments and they're not really meant um, to work. Uh, but I end, up, I end up getting kind of a funky render out, out of them anyway. So let's see if we go here. And you can mess with all these settings. For example, um, I really like the inflate, and then it's sort of going to blow up your mesh a little bit, and then apply a cloth sim to it. You can see it's quite slow um, because I'm in the, uh, in the higher setting here. Be a little bit fast. But yeah, it's just a case of having fun with it. And then once you have something that you like, for example, you've got a pinch perpendicular, which is really cool. Because you can either set it to radial or you can set it to something like a plane. And then you'll see it'll sort of pinch stuff together. So you can get really weird with it real quick. So see what happens when we do this around the eyes. That'll probably be quite creepy. There you go. This around the mouth as well. Maybe not as much. Let's tone down the strength a little bit. That is kind of weird looking, but uh, you get the idea. That's basically how I uh, how I ended up doing that. And then let's see if we go back into object mode. And another subdivision surface on top just to get the fine wrinkles. And then maybe it's interesting. Uh, let's see how we can do this. All right. So this is what I mean, uh, now that we have a camera view, or at least we're gonna create a camera view, we can get something going here. Um, see, let's try something like 70 millimeters. 
And what I found as well for uh, doing camera work is this Passport 2 setting, if you set it up to one, um, everything else turns black, but you get a way better idea of what your final image looks like and you can do it a little bit quicker now. This is just a very simple version. Uh, obviously, this is not gonna be anything final, but I just wanted to show you the, the general workflow of it. So we have a shader already set up. Um, gonna hide everything here and split this into two again. So we can do both our lighting and our shading at the same time. And you'll see this is actually fairly simple. So let's set this to rendered. And uh, I see a few questions came up, but I'll, I'll answer them in a little bit. I start with an area light. Make sure that I'm in cycles. Okay, so this mesh is quite large, so I'm going to have to crank up the power a little bit. Maybe crank up the size a little bit as well. And even this mesh that didn't seem all that interesting, um, just by adding a little bit of lighting to it, you can already start making really interesting looking things. Now in the case of the uh, the render, I would take a little bit more of a time. Uh, I would you take a little bit more time to fix the nose and things here. The idea is pretty cool. Um, but uh, so basically the shader was set to metallic with a fairly low roughness. And then you get that sort of extra interesting look. Now, the main thing to remember uh, that I use on this one is anisotropic reflections. So the way to remember these, and let me see if I can set the performance up a little bit higher here. so you can kind of see what they do, is they're gonna stretch your reflections over to one side. So when you think about it, it's like when you have uh, a cooking pot, and I forgot to switch over to the main screen, of course, uh, typical. Um, when you think about it, when you have something like a cooking pot and you look at it, all the reflections on it are sort of stretched upwards or to the side. And that's what an isotropic will do in the shader. It's gonna stretch these to one side. Rotation will, let you choose which side to stretch them to. So 0 and 0.5 are basically stretching them horizontally, and then uh, 0.25 and 0.75 will stretch them vertically. So the cool thing is you can put maps in there. So if you know those metal tables that exist with like, um, they're just flat metal and they look like they have all these circles in them, basically that's a great use of it as a tropic reflections. And the rougher your reflections are, the more you'll actually see the, uh, the result. So just by playing with this, you can get a completely different look uh, without having to actually adjust your lighting. So I'm quite liking these. I know in the other ones, I used the horizontal reflections and these, uh, with these, I'm gonna try vertical and see what happens. And then it's important to really look at your lights uh, in a different way because now they're not really lighting, they're just uh, reflecting. So you can see, let me, Change the color of this and up this a little bit. So now you can actually see how the, uh, the reflections react to the light. And that's why some of these don't actually look like they're lighting something, like this is behind it. But yet, just that little bit of a hint could help. Maybe have it up the top. Or as you can see here, down on the, uh, on the right, now we're starting to get some reflections around the neck be interesting to maybe light it from the top. There we go, get a little bit of extra lighting in there. I'm still not convinced red is the right color for this, but let's see. So it's all just about playing around and uh, having fun with it, which if you've watched one of my streams before is something I say a lot, so. <laughs> See if we can tweak the rotation a little bit. So just by tweaking the rotation, we can really focus the, the reflections. So maybe we want just the shape a little bit there. Or we have to move our light around a little bit. I don't really like the way it reflects down at the bottom here. So we can cheat and just uh, select a loop here on this side and 
just hitting control plus. There we go, we'll add a second shader. And we'll also make that metallic. But because it's a different shader, now we can control the, uh, the stuff down here separately. So if we would set it up the same way, you'll see we'll have the same issues, but now we've got a little bit more control. And because this is all black and white against, a, or at least black against the black background, we have a lot of flexibility there. So it's more about finding the image for me a lot of the times than it is about um, really knowing what I'm doing going in, uh, which seems kind of counterproductive, but it's a fun way of working, I find. So see what happens if we change the metallic nature of it so by just bringing the metallic down a little bit and mixing it in with the white here we get a more interesting look we can color the base mesh even if we wanted to although one of the things i'm going to do is just move my camera over a little bit there we go now we see the dividing line here so let's see if we can get it to a point where we actually don't see it. So here you'll see the uh, the mesh sort of disappears behind the other one. If I assign that second material there, and this is a very quick and dirty way of doing it. If I had a little bit more time, I might use a texture map and all these kind of things. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So one of the other things we definitely need in this is some depth of field. Let's turn it on. And by hitting E in here, you can just click anywhere in your viewport and it will take that um, that length, I guess, uh, which is kind of nice. So let's overdo it on the f-stop. There we go. Now it's all soft and creepy. And this is okay. I mean, obviously I just did this really quickly, so it's not gonna be a masterpiece, but um, it's a case of just having fun and, and trying to find a cool image. Like how far can we go before it really feels... Let's change the blue. Yeah, I kind of like it when it's, uh, when it's a bit more uh, neutral, I guess. So yeah, it's a case of messing with the contrast settings here. And I tend to use the curves in here a fair bit because I uh, I do all the compositing and everything in Blender. So it's a case of pushing it up a little bit. Could be that these aren't working properly because of uh, the daily builds, though. I've had issues with them in the past, yeah. Uh, so let's save that real quick. Um... There we go, and uh, I'm gonna open the proper one from the website. So uh, I've been having some issues with my build lately. I need to re rebuild it from scratch. Normally this should work now. If you have a look, yeah, that was down to my janky version. Still a lot slower than it should be though. So something's up, but. That's okay. It's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, that's just a very quick workflow on, on how to do that. Um, obviously, if we're going to add in even more lights, let's grab this orange one. We can get even crazier with it. And you see, just even though it's pointing at the completely wrong direction, we're still getting interesting reflections. Um, I believe one of the things I did as well Let's go back to the color here and mess with it. Uh, let's see. Oh, that orange was actually kind of cool. Let's maybe tone it down a little bit. There you go. You can kind of still see it's a human. I wish these stupid curves would work. No, they're just horribly broken. That's fine. 
that's experimental versions for you anyway one of the other things that I wanted to show real quick as well is I'm just gonna crank up the uh, exposure real quick as a quick hack so you can kind of see a little bit better what I'm doing um, so one of the other things I was doing as well is using a layer weight node with Fresnel and uh, the fun thing is you can really mess around with this but also putting that through a color ramp means you can get even more color variation on the uh, on the scene if you wanted to so and this will change depending on how much you use it to influence it so let's say we want to set this one to the same base color real quick so now if we input it nothing is going to change but if we grab this one this is going to be all the edges you'll see now in the creases we'll get different colors and that little bit of purple in there looks really interesting so I almost feel forced to finish this up a little bit but um but it's it's very subtle as you can see but just that little bit adds in a little bit more just really accentuates the shape and um yeah there's nothing stopping you from doing this like shaders don't have to be realistic for a cool effect they can be kind of weird and out there um let's grab that last area of light see if we can move it around a little bit just to get a little bit more of a subtle look there we go see what happens if we set that one to purple Accent it a little bit. No, not quite as much as I would have hoped. Bring it up a little bit. No, bring it down a little bit. No, oh, that's actually kind of okay where it is. Yep. Yeah. And when you're moving, you can always uh, hit escape to get it back to where it was. So that looks kind of okay. But that's a, a very brief overview uh, of how that works. Now I'll open the other one just to see if I've missed anything. Uh, there's a second screen opening here, which I'm just going to close. So let's look at the shader. So yeah, these uh, eye and teeth shaders are basically from the add-on that I used. I think the teeth are the ones that I tweaked. Uh, so let me have a quick look here to see. Object, yeah, so this is the, the tooth shader, I guess you could call it, or teeth shader. Uh, so it's just a tiny bit of subsurface and um, yeah not quite white uh, because if you put the teeth 100% white they look really kind of weird like if I set them up here no, don't want them to glow they just seemed a little bit too much especially without the subsurface now they're just like they feel a little plasticky so just a little bit of subsurface tends to help with teeth uh, I find although I'm not an expert I don't do a lot of um, realistic teeth to begin with uh, if i'm honest then there's a noise texture in here as well just to add a little bit of bump to them so they're not 100 percent perfect and that's about it the eyes uh i didn't basically didn't change at all um because i got it free from the shader so i think in the other one the other image i just put a um what was i going to say i put a uh I think iris is the one yeah just the hue and saturation and messed with it or i didn't even think i probably didn't even change it uh, this was cornea i think messed it up now there we go cornea and it is the iris that i'm looking for so i think the only thing i really changed in the other one is the hue which you can do uh from the shader itself which is kind of fun um, but then let's have a quick look at the lighting, for example. So there's one light here, uh, and both of these lights are white lights, so that's what's different. All of the coloring is being done by that uh, Fresnel trick that I showed you earlier. So both of these lights are just regular uh, white lights. There's nothing different about them, nothing special about them. But uh, again, the this is without the metallic setup, and this is with the metallic setup. So you can see there's a little bit of subsurface in there. I don't know how much it really contributes to the 
final image. Let's see if we can change this again, just to, just to see if we can see it change. Yeah. So yeah, the subsurface doesn't add anything uh, because the metallic is set to one, uh, which I thought, but I wasn't sure. Um, so this this is the colors basically. As you can see, that's what the Fresnel is doing. It's just coloring these. Um, then I've thrown it through a hue and saturation just to really boost the saturation and overdo it. And then uh, when the metallic is, is set up to 100%, you get these really nice, cool looking effects. The only thing I, I did extra is add a um, displacement modifier on it just to give a little bit more texture to the wrinkles, but it's very, very subtle. You can barely see it. So I could have left that off probably um, without without really changing the image that much. So, But again, here, if we look at that rotation, let's say I rotate it to be vertical, you'll see it's a completely different image just by messing with the shader here. So once we approach 0.5, it becomes the same again because it's horizontal once more. And then uh, once we go up higher, uh, it goes back to horizontal towards the end. So it's cool. It's a fun, uh, fun shading trick. So. And then, like I said, post-production wise, uh, very little, just a little bit of denoising uh, and, and some glare and some sharpening. That's, and that's it. So basic stuff, uh, nothing, nothing to write home about, I guess. Um, so let's have a look at the other one, just for completionist's sake. Wrinkle four, wrinkle four. And close the second screen here. So this one is, doesn't look all that great when you look at the mesh, like I, uh, I ended up fixing a lot of this in shading. So something's off here, which wasn't before, I think. Um, so that might be a Blender version issue that, uh, that I'm encountering, but I'm not gonna worry about that too much. Uh, just to show you the same idea. So again, very little post-processing. Same idea, so layer weight with Fresnel, color ramp in there, doing the same thing, boosting the saturation, and uh, finally just that. And I believe, yeah, instead of an area light, I use a sunlight for one of these. So there's one coming from the top, which you'll see. Let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on. You'll see is uh, providing most of the stuff, and then there's one in the back here. Uh, which is blue, and I made that one blue just to accentuate the edge a little bit here and make it fit in with the, the overall image. So, um, yeah, that's that. It's time for some uh, questions before I move on to the next ones. And uh, if you have them, yeah, now would be the time to ask a few questions. And then I'll move on to sort of the behind the scenes of the goopy ones, and then I'll try and create one completely from scratch. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to take, but we'll see. We'll just have fun with it. So let's see. Um, so Paolo asks, I need to ask you something. I sent you an email the other day regarding the workstation the problems installing NVIDIA drivers on Linux. I already sent you an email back, so check your email. But um, I use Subuntu and I have no issues with it whatsoever. It works very well. It's very robust. Um, most distributions nowadays aren't, aren't that problematic, I found. Um, yeah, it just, just works. Um, if you if you go for one that's like quite supported, like uh, Ubuntu or Fedora or some or one of those that are a little bit bigger and have a slightly bigger community, then uh, you'll have less issues. I think um, I don't know what the situation is on Fedora, but on Ubuntu it works really well. So um, same with something like Solus, I used that for a little bit as well recently, and that worked really well too. So. Um, So, uh, and then I'll just show you, yeah, I don't really have a, a menu here, but this is the way it works on uh, Ubuntu. In the software and updates application, you've got an additional drivers tab, and all you really need to do, give it a second here to queue, uh, to query the internet. And I'll actually show this on the main screen real quick. Uh, you can just then select which one. It'll install the drivers for you and then uh, we can just 
yeah, you just restart and everything should work uh, pretty well. So it used to be more of an issue. The last couple of years, it's really come around and, and become quite easy. By default, it's going to use this uh, Nuvo driver, but it doesn't have any, any proper CUDA support or anything like that. So you want to switch over to this. So this is one of the main reasons I keep using or keep coming back to Ubuntu because it's just so easy to use. And even through the terminal, it's just one command now to install them properly. So um, most distros have something similar as far as I know. So... Uh, the scope is so horrible. Yes, it was. They are all horrible, but you can see that even with horrible scopes, you can do fun stuff. Um, yeah, you can kind of go go either way with a lot of this stuff. So, like Looking Glass from the recent Watchmen show had his mask all wrinkly. Yeah, that was a cool show as well. Um, but yeah, it reminded me of that a little bit as well when I was working on it. So. Um, so then, thank you for the streams. Well, thank you for being here. Um, have I had any intersection problems with the cloth brush? Um, yeah, it's not perfect. I mean, you probably saw it while I was doing this. Uh, let me make a new one as well and uh, import that same thing, that same object, real quick. So uh, let's really apply this, smooth it out, and go into sculpt mode real quick. So cloth, cloth, cloth. There we go. Um, you'll see if you really overdo it with some of the brushes. Uh, if I make this a little bit bigger. Let me turn off symmetry because it's doing a bunch of unnecessary calculations. Once you really start pushing it and it starts wrinkling together, you will get uh, stuff that self intersects. So it is quite easy to mess the mesh up, um, but it really depends on the tool. The regular one isn't too bad. Like this pinch perpendicular, especially if you set it to plane, um, you can get some really nasty intersections going. But the longer you mess with the brush, the more of an effect that you get. I also, there you go. So with this kind of overhang, it, uh, it folds in on itself, but you can do some cool stuff. Um, again, you can smooth this all out and then do it and then it won't be as bad. And I'm using a really huge brush as well. So if I'm bringing this in and making it a little bit smaller, then uh, you have a bit more control. So generally you can do like the bigger wrinkles with a big brush very quickly and then bring in the smaller wrinkles for more control. And this is just the best thing ever. I mean, I, I totally understand the hype. It is a lot of fun to use. And then especially with the, uh, the planar mode, you can sort of accentuate shapes here and make it look really creepy. Well, there we go, and create another really creepy mesh. And I mean, it was bound to happen that people would start using it on faces. I saw somebody do it before, uh, before I started doing it, so I can't claim all the originality on that one. But it looks interesting. I mean, horror sculptors are, are having a great time probably nowadays. Uh, and again, if we just use the drag, the, the default one, then you're just kind of dragging it along and pushing it. There's the uh, inflate brush as well, which inflates the mesh. And you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it and have fun with it. Like the more I drag the mouse around, the more weirdness I get really. So if you do it too quickly, then the simulation uh, has a hard time following. But if you do it slowly, then you can really affect it. You can see the cloth moving in real time. So uh, actually, let's stick to questions. A few more questions. Um, looks like Deadpool without the mask. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, hi, Prashant. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, I hope that's how you say your name. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Um, looks reptilian. Yeah, I, I don't know. I was just trying stuff out as usual, but yeah, it's fun. So how do I get the human models? That's what I was showing earlier. Let's see if Firefox is still open. It is not. So uh, there's a thing called MB Lab, but now they have a website. It's mblab.dev. Let's switch over to the main screen. Um, this is what it's called. If you Google it, you'll find it. And uh, it just gives you a completely fully raked human uh, with a couple of clicks. So 
I, uh, I use that thing all the time uh, for generating all kinds of humans and then posing them afterwards. Um, do I use Furchok or Animation Nose much? No, not that much. Um, occasionally I'll, I'll try it out, but um, it's, it's got a fairly steep learning curve and I feel there's a lot of stuff in Blender that I'm still, um, that I can still learn before I start moving over to those. I've used them on some projects once or twice uh, for specific effects, but I don't use them every day. So, um, so last last two quick questions. Any other cool new tools in Blender you'd recommend? Um, yeah, we'll get to one of those with the uh, with the the goop thing, and I'll show you one of the things that I've been using a lot lately. Um, it's the uh, um, random coloring by mesh island i i'm completely spacing on the name right now but i'll, I'll show you in a little bit it's in the in shading and then five questions what do i use to composite uh, i use just blender most of the time i don't really use anything else uh i like blender's compositor it uh it's basic but it does everything i need it to do and uh yeah i've gotten used to using it so i don't really miss other stuff um i used to use after effects back in the day um and I've been looking into lately how I can, um, I guess, get some of the After Effects functionality back with Eevee, and it's pretty cool. So right now I've been using the Blender Compositor, and if I have to do like 2D motion graphics, I've been using Eevee a lot as well, um, which has made things quite fun, actually. So let's get back to, uh, to creating this thing. It's cool mesh, but we're just going to destroy it. There we go. Uh, so let's move on to these. So these are kind of fun. Um, if you hadn't guessed already, uh, obviously it's done with meta balls. So um, I'll mess around a little bit with those and uh, we'll create one from scratch. Uh, the cool thing is that there's very only very basic shading in here and all of almost all of the color is coming from one texture um, in the environment rather than texturing everything separately. But uh, again, I'll show you how uh, what that looks like once we get there. So. Let's get started. I'll actually build one from scratch, and then you can see the full uh, the full process. So first thing I need to start doing is creating all these meta balls, and I'm going to move these down, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. And then create. Let's see. We have different shapes. Um, let's do the capsule. And let's do the ellipsoid. No, it's not that different. Um, do cubes as well because cubes are always fun. C and then and you might be wondering why I'm, why I'm doing this, but you'll see that uh, in a minute while it's why I'm doing it. So let's scale this one up a little bit so they're relatively the same side uh, side size. And then this one, there we go. I'll move over. Uh, actually, let's duplicate it and do that same thing. And uh, this one, I'm going to scale on the x axis and make it three times as long, maybe a little bit more. Scale this two and a half times. <clears throat> now I've got some of these that are uh, a little bit longer than others, just to give it a little bit extra. And copy them over. And uh, let's see. Let's rotate these on the y-axis, ninety degrees. Copy them over again, and. We'll rotate them on the x-axis, 90 degrees. And now we've got them going in uh, three different directions, which is what I want. And move these down now, but I gotta make sure it's just them. There we go. Select all of them, move them into a new collection called balls, because why not? Uh, now we can close that up. So for the next step to get them all distributed, um, we're gonna actually use a particle system. So um, let's see how big we can create this cube. Uh, something like this. Uh, 
There we go. And I'm going to set the cube up here um, just to have it start at the middle uh, to make it easier for certain things. If should I choose to change something, and we're going to throw in a camera as well. And all I'm doing it is just resetting the rotation. And uh, here we go. I'll make it square like the others. And now what I'm doing is I'm going into um, wireframe mode to see if the cube actually, if you can see the edges of the cube um, within the camera. And the reason I do this is uh, just so I know, and I'm just going to scale it on the X and Z axes, just so I know there's going to be particles generated in the entire field of view of the camera. So with that set up, we can start setting up the particle system. There we go. Add up the particle system. And let me just change my settings here real quick. Um, oh. And have them start at a thousand. Uh, then let's see. Actually, let's do this. And set the physics to none. And there we go. Now we have all these particles. Now, uh, if you set the physics to none, they won't move. So it's great to use them as a static uh, generator. And the reason I do this is because I want to use the volume rather than the faces. Uh, and I was, if I was going to use hair, then the volume wouldn't work. So let's see. Uh, I'm just going to make these a little bit bigger so we can see exactly what's going on. And I didn't do this for all of them, but I figured it'd be cool to show anyway. Um, I'm going to use a texture. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can see what's going on here. And by throwing a texture in the particle system, we can actually control where the particles are. So if I set this to density, then you'll see um, if I change the size, nothing happens because there's a, a bit of a bug in here. If I change the size here, you'll actually see it happening. You'll see because this is quite small. Let's see, set this to five. We can actually see the particles show up. Maybe set this to 25 just to show you real quick. And now you can see how they show up uh, in the texture. That just gives you a little bit more artistic control of where they are and how, how they're like clustered together. So we're going to add the number of particles up a little bit. Let's see. So you can actually see the texture moving and the, the particles themselves. But I want something a bit more interesting. Ah, and I'm messing with the size instead of the movement, of course. Typical. So here you can actually see it better. Set this to object. Actually generated was working quite well, so let's stick to that. Let's go back to these Blender original ones. So now you can see maybe it's a bit on the large size. If I bring this down, so you can see how you can control the particles clustering. So if you want to do something like star systems or similar things to that, you can really uh, get the most out of some of these textures. Now, as you've seen, this stuff is pretty old and janky, and the, the particle system isn't getting a lot of love lately because they're going to uh, replace it with a new one. But there's still a lot to be done with it. So let's see if we can get something that looks kind of interesting here. And if it doesn't work out, we can always throw it out. And it's sort of an interesting distribution. They're kind of all over the place. Bring down the size a little bit. And at this point, maybe there's no point to doing it like this, but it was just to show you. I think I did it on the first one. I think I didn't bother with it on the other ones. But here we go. We have a little bit of an interesting distribution. 
And um, it's good to know that if you mess with these, this number isn't actually the number of particles that you're seeing right now. So you might have to crank it up a little bit um, to get a little bit more. There we go. I can see they're sort of all over the place. Now, one of the things to do before we throw these in here is to set the viewport, um, the uh, viewport resolution quite high just so we don't have epic slowdowns because um, it's going to take a little bit to calculate. So I'm going to save my file first. And let's see, where are we? Um, Technogoop. Four. All right, and now uh, if it crashes, then it's not too much of an issue. So what we're gonna do is set the render type to collection, and then we can get the balls collection. I'm gonna pick random and use the object rotation. And now the reason we're not seeing anything is because I have to bring the scale up, but you'll see as soon as I do this, and I'll go back to uh, regular mode. So we're gonna not render the emitter and not show the emitter in the viewport. Um, as soon as I bring the scale up, we'll start getting that effect. Uh, and we can mess with the scale randomness as well, just to give it a little bit more. And you'll see uh, if you're setting this up on a bit of a, a bit more um, on a lower resolution with the meta balls, then this would be extremely slow. So just to show you really quick, and I can always close it if it crashes. Um, if we select this and just set the few port resolution down to like 0.5, you're gonna have to wait a little bit. Come on. Oh, I already did it. There you go. Now we've got more geometry, but it is slower, so it's something to consider. Now, um, let's see if we can get our camera view to look at something interesting here, because we want to keep it fairly quick, but we do want to see a bit of detail. So we can actually still see some of this in the background, which is fine. I have a fix for that. Now, yeah, this is actually looking pretty good. Now, we got to make sure that. Our geometry is subdivided enough. So we're looking at about a million faces. Maybe divide it down a little bit more. Because this is actually looking pretty nice, so I think I'm gonna stick with this setup. Um, let's see if we go down to 0 0.35. This is gonna take a while every time. Come on, you can do it. Nah. So the reason uh, I put these down here, I can explain that in the meantime, is so they don't stick together like in the middle here and you have all of them uh, stuck together there. So now we're up to two million faces, but that means if we go in a camera view and we zoom in a little bit, at least the polygons won't be as visible as quickly. Um, so that's kind of a fun, fun lattice. So what I'm gonna do now is actually to preserve everything I have, I'm gonna export this to an OBJ file. Just the selection and I'm not gonna write the materials and I don't need to triangulate the faces, so that's all I need. And this will also take a while because it's two million faces and that tends to take a fair amount of time. But um, switch over to questions while that's working. So uh, not that many questions, but any other cool new tools? Yeah, I answered that one. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, I know you don't like modeling much, but do you use hard ops, box cutter, or other modeling tools at all? Um, I own hard ops, and, but I've never really used it that much. Um, I really have to take the time to learn the proper workflow with it. Uh, so generally, if I model stuff, I just model it really quickly with the tools in Blender. I don't really, I don't know. It's a cool tool, don't get me wrong. It's just that um, I don't always feel the need to learn a new uh, 
a new workflow and um, while I like it and I think it's a great great addition to the Blender tool set it's just not really in my wheelhouse I don't do a lot of modeling anyway and when I do it's simple enough that I can just use the Blender tools now something that I've noticed and you might have seen this as well is that it jumped and changed um, so I'm going to set this back up to 1.5 just for speed's sake and hope that it exported the other one and not this one. Let's see what that says. Bring it back in. Again, give it a second. Come on. Yeah, so uh, definitely did something uh, weird to the uh, to the mesh. So that's not what we want. That is quite annoying even. So let's delete this. Um, and it might just be a bug that I need to figure out what's happening and, uh, and report it. The weird thing is if I set this up, like if I turn the particle system off and then back on, then we get this one again, uh, which is the one we wanted in the first place. So yeah, I don't know exactly what's going on there. But again, it might be something I'm doing. It might be a bug. I need to take the time to investigate a little bit. Now I'm gonna add a bit more particles in because I just want just a tiny bit more structure. And what we're gonna try and do then instead see if that works uh, you can also mess with the uh, influence threshold which is fun it basically uh, tells it how much they, they goop together or how much they they kind of become a little bit more skinny so I like them to goop together a little bit so you can see this has changed again so yeah there's definitely a, a weird bug going on there and I could do this in the stable version which means it might work correctly but that would be no fun would it life's more interesting with a, a bug here and there let's add some more particles into the mix and there you go now it's uh, switched over again it's weird let's see what happens when we turn these off and on there we go. Now we get the, the version that'll export again. So I have no idea what's going on there. It's too bad, but it is what it is. So let's see. We have some kind of structure we can use. Uh, maybe a little bit more. And this is a case of tweaking it. So I like building these systems that you can just tweak rather than uh, have to model and do because it, it just allows you to get interesting results quickly and experiment a lot more that's okay we've got a gap in the back there but i can deal with that that's fine all right let's see what happens when we export this if it stays the same just to make sure there's some separation here and there yeah it looks like there is we'll see we can always redo it if we have to. Uh, let's up the resolution here. <clears throat> and I think I set it to 0.35 earlier, so I might have to do that again. Uh, let's see, more questions real quick. Oh, hey, Robert. Yeah, I saw you uh, tagging that. I, I'm uh, happy you're enjoying the, uh, the add-ons, so. <laughs> Sidebar on the left looks so empty, mine's completely clogged up. Or on the right, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I tend not to use too much extra stuff. Um, I like to keep the screen as clean as possible while I'm working. Uh, I don't like distractions when I'm working, so it's one of the reasons that... Um, and it's not that I don't like other add-ons, it's just that 
if I'm relying, I feel like if I'm relying on an add-on too much to do stuff and it disappears, um, I don't want to have that, you know, happen basically. So most of the ones that you'll see even on the side are the ones that I've created myself because I know I can always update them uh, to make them work again if they if that needs to happen. So let's see. I think this mesh will work, but we might have to experiment a little bit more. That's all right. Let's export it once again. So we're up to three million faces. It's going to take even longer, most likely. Um, I'm wondering if this is overkill. Maybe it is. Let's drop it down a little bit. Come on, you can do it. There we go. The resolution on that is still fairly decent. Let's see if we zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you can kind of see the individual polygons. Hmm. Let's try it like this and see what happens. I can always change it after if I have to. Uh, export it. Settings have been saved. And the reason I'm looking at these polygons so closely is because generally um, a lot of the stuff that I render, so if we grab the print version here, now you'll see it's actually rendered at a huge resolution. So this one's 9,000 by 9,000. Um, and I render them that big because I want to be able to print them really big as well. So here you'll see the polygons just a little bit, but not enough for it to really be annoying. So that's kind of why I'm looking at the, the resolution of everything. So you can see them here a little bit as well, but it's not the worst. Um, but that just gives you an idea of... Uh, why I zoom in on that and kind of look at it. Same with these ones as well. They're all huge. So you want to make sure that they actually look good when you get a little bit closer up. Um, the first one here as well. So here, this is the earlier one. So here you'll see some of it. Uh, I should have exported this in a slightly, you know, higher resolution. But at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world. I'm not too bothered by it. But yeah, let's close this as well real quick. So that's that. We can turn all this stuff off. And even now it's having a hard time. I should have turned down this uh, resolution before I turn them off. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Yeah, so a lot of waiting. <laughs> I hope my audio didn't just break. Let me know uh, if it did. Jeez, it's still going. I broke it. Let's just open a new one. Because technically we've exported it, so we can just keep working in this file. Uh, let's see. All right. Thanks for the update on the audio. <laughs> I'm always worried that I'm gonna break something. Last time it got all weird and wonky on me. So um, <clears throat> hopefully uh, this time doesn't happen. Come on, import it, please. Let's see if the other one, uh, oh, that one came back, so yeah. Let's just do it in the original file. Import object. 
There we go. And I do that quite a lot, um, where if I've got a rigged character or something before I start doing all the weird stuff to it, I'll just export it to an OBJ. That way, if in the future something changes in Blender and my rig gets messed up or whatever, I still have that original model if I want to go back and do it. Um, uh, before I start doing a lot of shading and rendering, I try to make sure that um, outside of some modifiers or even a bunch of modifiers, uh, anything that might break in the future, uh, this is kind of collapsed down just in case I have to open this file at some point in the future. So there we go. So one of the first things we can do is just go into edit mode and give it a second here. There we go. And delete these because we don't need them. And now we just have the one object to deal with. And you can see it's fairly slow, but in object mode, it's not too bad. So I'm going to turn off the cube, which was uh, the emitter. Give everything names and mesh.lobs. There we go. Now, let's see. Um, I'm going to bring this in a little bit and bring this in a little bit so we've got a bit more space to work with. And the first thing I'm going to do is look through my camera view here. I'm going to try and fill up the background. I'm going to do this in the cheapest, easiest way possible. I'm going to make uh, an instance of this. So instead of hitting Shift-D, I'm hitting Alt-D, and that way it's an instance mesh. And I'm just going to scale it up. And what I'm going to try and do is fill up the background somehow. Let's see if that's possible at all. And I'll put a light. Uh, let's just put something in here. Let's just bring this up a little bit. And that way I can see the background really easy so I can see whether a background is getting filled up or not. So I want to try and close all those holes just by looking for the right place to put this. Um, oh. uh, there we go. Uh, maybe rotate this a little bit. Now again, it's just hunting for the right composition. He's scaling it up a little bit. It's all about cheap tricks. So I've got most of the holes closed now. Let's see. There's just the one up at the top, but that's okay because what we can do is go into this. And we'll grab this one. And I could have turned off edit mode, uh, the camera rather, to make this go a little bit quicker. So let's see if we can do that. Or the render rather. There we go. And now it's just a case of duplicating it. Now it's going to do so in both meshes, but it's not really an issue because there are instances. Now I just have to look at where this is. So we need it up there. So you can barely see it through the... Uh, drop it in the right place almost so if we do edges that better view better visible there we go I just need to move it over on the x-axis a little bit that's slow but there we go now if we render this we won't have any black spots in our background there we go so that's sorted uh, and we can not set this to render, set this to solid and go out of edit mode. You can do it. There we go. Solid, please. Thank you. All right, so that's that. 
and now we can start the shading process. So what I was saying earlier uh, with the examples is that the shading itself is uh, not extremely complicated, but the trick to this one is actually something else. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring down the roughness on this shader um, and you'll see why in just a second and bring the metallic up a little bit. You can already start kind of seeing that style. So the trick to this one is actually all in the world panel. So what I'm doing is I'm grabbing a wave texture in this case. Uh, I'm going to try and do it from scratch and not steal it from the other scene. And uh, what this does is it just puts a wave texture in the uh, sort of, yeah, Let's see if we see this, um, just puts it in the uh, environment. So you can use procedural textures to uh, shade stuff as well uh, in your environment, which is fun because it gives you all these really interesting looking options. Now, I know I put this fairly small. I'm going to try and do this from scratch. There we go. And add in a bunch of distortion because we do want a bit of color distortion. And now for the main part of this, what I'm going to do is just push it through a color ramp Stick this in the background, uh, set the background strength a little bit higher so it's actually emitting a bit more light. And then all we're going to do is just change these colors. Let's see, uh, we can try to follow the color wheel a little bit just to see what happens. We might want a blue one in here as well. There we go. And what you can do is you can distrib distribute these stops evenly, and now you've just got an even color wheel. Now with this setup, we can really start playing around with uh, which colors we can actually see. The distortion, I tend to twist this around a little bit so you can see what's going on. And once we have something that looks kind of cool, so that actually looks kind of interesting. So if we move the green up or down, move it down a little bit. The blue is quite nice. Maybe a bit more pink or a bit more red. If we bring this more to red, it's kind of cool. And I'm going to turn up the uh, performance here as well so you can see what I'm doing a little bit better on the stream. And now all I'm going to do is switch back to object mode, select one of my meshes, and start tweaking the shader. So right now it's mostly metallic. I'm going to bring that in just a little bit, um, and then we can change the base color. So this is one of the uh, the features that I really like that's been put in. Um, I think it's in 2.8 already as well, uh, 2.82 already as well. And under the geometry tab, you've got a random per island. So basically it's going to grab if we go down there. Yeah, the point in this always takes a while to calculate. There we go. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to grab a random color between black and white for each mesh island. So every piece of mesh that isn't connected to another one will get a different color. Now, as you can see, most of our mesh is connected, so we don't have as much, um, I was going to say, as much uh, variation as I would have liked. But... Um, that's okay, it's not the worst thing. The cool thing is you can then, again, pipe that through a color ramp and start messing with it. So um, generally I'll use color ramp set to constant just to select certain parts. So I can give these ones uh, some different shading in a minute. And I can add in a second color ramp here. There we go, and uh, pipe this into the base color. So let's see what happens here. Uh, throw in a mix shader. Add this color ramp in. So now some of them will have different shading than others. And for this one, I'm going to throw in a glass shader. And I'll show you a cool trick I picked up at the Blender conference uh, about shading glass. It was really nice. Um, I want this to be kind of nutty. Let's see if we mess with the color of the glass, which gives kind of weird results. If you want to color glass correctly, you actually have to use volume absorption. 
shader in the volume slot and then it will absorb the light uh, more correctly so now we get darker glass if we want so a reddish glass that could work let's bring down the index of refraction no that's actually quite cool You don't really see the color change much. Um, it's not the end of the world. And just by using this color ramp, we can control how much of the mesh is actually that glass shader now, because we've got one really big connected piece in the middle. Um, this works a little bit, it's a little bit over the top, but it's fun nonetheless. Uh, you could add in a second one here if you wanted to make an even bigger selection. You can control it here. So now we've got a lot of that glass in there. And I'm going to throw out the volume absorption because I don't like it quite as much. You can mess with the roughness of the glass, see what happens. And this is mostly just what I'm doing uh, when I'm doing this kind of thing. Just kind of screwing around, trying things out. Um, Maybe leave the glass. Yeah, so you get all kinds of weird things going. So the trick with the glass that I wanted to show you real quick is, let's see, I'm gonna make these a little bit darker just so I can show you what's going on. So I don't know how visible it will be in this scene, but basically um, with glass, you can sometimes get really weird dark edges and generally, what I'm doing is I'm going to grab a mix shader with the glass. And like I said, this is kind of a trippy scene to show the song, but uh, you might see a little bit of a difference. Uh, but if you want to get really clean looking glass, this really, really helps. And then I'm going to grab a light path. And what we're going to do is the ray depth is basically how many times a ray has either reflect, refracted or reflected. And the deeper it goes, the more chances you have of it going to kind of like black and dark. So what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna say after a number of rays, after a number of times the, the light has sort of penetrated through the different objects and the different glass objects, I want you to um, become transparent. So all the light just kind of goes, flows through a little bit. So just by using a math node here, and saying uh, anything greater than 16. And that kind of comes back to my light paths here um, that I have 16 uh, transmission rays, for example. So anything higher than that basically has to be replaced with a um, transparent shader. And I don't know how much of a difference we'll see but, um, and this number is quite arbitrary. You can change it to different things. Uh, if you change it up, your glass will become a little bit darker again. And it depends on your render settings, how far you should go. I found with 16 that it worked fairly decent with my settings, but I tweak it on a scene by scene basis. So this is with, and this is without. So we can see there's still, there's a lot of internal reflections that seem to be getting lost because of it. So we might have to crank it up a little bit. See if there's any difference now. Not much. So maybe in this case, it wasn't all that necessary, but eh, it is what it is. I'll leave it in there just to brighten it up a little bit. Um, then let's see with these guys. Let's try and put some color in this thing. Nothing's really happening because the uh, a bunch of our things are glass down here. So if I take this away, set this one to black again, then you'll actually see that color coming in on some of them. And again, we're a bit unlucky with this one big block that sticks together, but that just adds to the charm. Let's see if we can get more color on it there. If we color it a bit more blue. Yeah, 
And again, what we can do is we can mess with the reflections, see what these anisotropic reflections might do or might not do. They don't have as much of an effect. Let's go back to the world and see what we can do there. Let's introduce a bit more darkness in this, so there's more contrast in the map. Now we're getting a fairly interesting looking thing. Thank God art is subjective. <laughs> Let's see if we take away the metallic on this one. Bring up the specular, really overdo it. And a little bit of clear coat, so it's extra glossy. Let me just mess with the colors. The red worked quite well, actually. There we go. We can mess with the scale as well. And see what happens if we set this to rings. Maybe change the way they're aligned. And if we get a really big scale. There we go, now it's starting to get interesting. So if you make the scale really small, you'll see all this weirdness, which also has an interesting look to it, I guess, but I want to keep the color as a bit more vibrant and big and crazy. It's cool that you can kind of see it turn around as we're uh, creating this. Ooh, I'm starting to like that one. So just changing one of these colors can really dramatically change the overall look. I kind of like it where it is. Maybe I'll turn the pink a little bit more. And that's actually not half bad. And again, I'm just searching. Uh, if this one doesn't end up making it, uh, generally when I do a bunch of these series, I'll just make a whole bunch of them and then pick the ones that I like. I don't always post everything I make, um, just because some of them just don't work out and that's fine. What happens if we up the index of refraction? Not much going on there. What if we make this one big block of glass? That's not very legible. Maybe one or two of them could be glass on top of blue. Oh, we're just a little unlucky with the shape. That's okay. Let's tone this down and see what happens. Ooh, that's very red. So I think what we're going to do is add a hue and saturation in here and just push the colors way beyond what they're supposed to be. We might do that in post-production as well. Looks like my, I might actually have to go back to the original shape. It's not really uh, working out, I think. Too stuck together. Now what we can do is just cheat. I 
Let's grab, so I'm in edge mode now. Let's grab some random edge loops, see if that works. Oh man, doesn't like that. Let's see if this one works. Let's see if uh, material preview works a little bit better. It does not because that doesn't work yet in EV. That's too bad. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab the edge of this one here and totally cheat. That's what 3D is about anyway, so it's fine. Uh, I just want the inside of this one. It's not going to work. I want this and this. And now let's see if we can show this live uh, with the rendered view. If I were to edge split this, then this becomes a separate mesh island and our layout and our colors should change accordingly. Should. There we go. So something happened. Our um, edge split definitely helped. Now we're going to have to re redo our sort of... Uh, color ramp for the um, random per island, but that means we can use that to break it up a little bit more and uh, you won't really see it in all the chaos that is this crazy, crazy mesh. So let me just look at this one separately. So we're looking at it from this side. Where else can we add in a little... This seems like a decent candidate. And again, let's switch this to solid just so it's a little bit quicker. These metaball meshes are not the best. Generally, I smooth them as well, which I haven't done yet, which maybe I should, but uh, let's edge split again here. I don't know of another way to do that yet, but what I am going to do is add these to a vertex group. And you'll see why for later. And just, uh, come on, edges. And I'm gonna select, come on, uh, no. What I'm gonna do is gonna select all by trait and then non-manifold, and it's gonna grab all the open edges. So the ones that I created earlier should be in there as well somewhere. Should be, yeah. I have no idea where I put them. That's one. I don't know where the other one went. But let's see. Anyway, I'm gonna assign these. So later when we smooth the mesh, oh, there we go. There's the other one. So I'll select that one as well. Um, so if we end up smoothing the mesh, then we can uh, keep those edges in place so we don't get any holes. Um, this is a really giant block, which I'd like to split up somehow. A lot of connections going on here. So maybe they haven't been split up. That could also be an issue, but we'll see. Oh, wrong screen. Actually, I'll make this a little bit bigger for the time being. Come on. Let's split this one up here as well. Or, hmm. Actually, let's see what it, what happens when we use this, because it might not work perfectly because they are still connected somewhere else. So, it might not be uh, one hundred percent. But we'll see. Back out of edit mode. I'm just trying to split up that big block in the middle. Oh. 
Beat this one, bring it back in. So obviously the main block is the first one, but we get a bit more of a split it seems. Not much, just a little bit. Still not 100% convinced. Let's see, we can set this to constant as well, so we're getting the full color whenever it switches over. Hmm, doesn't look like it helped much. I think I'm gonna have to make more splits. Boring, but not the worst thing ever. Try and make these in interesting places that aren't super visible. So you'll see the normals of the mesh aren't great either with the meta balls, um, but that's just how they work, unfortunately. Let's see if we split this. Come on. I grab all of them, almost. Grab these two, these two, that one. Come on and do. They're working on it, so I hope it doesn't crash on me. I haven't saved in a while. I hit save real quick. There we go. Let's split again and make sure I assign these. We really want to split this middle one up somehow. Let's see some of these in the front. Let's see how they're hooked up to the middle one. This looks like it could be a good division to split up. Though sometimes some of this stuff takes some manual uh, manual finessing, I guess you could call it. And split it up through here. Get back around. Where are we going? Hmm, might have made a mistake on this one, but we'll see. Good God, so many polygons. Hmm, we're gonna have to solve this one differently. Let's unselect that. Let's go over here and select these ones. Oh, look at that. I looked back. Edge split. Assign it to the edges group. Still nothing? Come on. Aha, no, it looks like we're making some progress. Still that big one in the middle though. I might have to go back to the drawing board on this one. But that's okay. We've got a, oh, not rendered. We've got a setup for now, so we know what we need to avoid now. Here you can see it in all its glory in the weird, uh, <laughs> really weird looking background. Let's hide this one for a sec and 
this is going to take forever because I forgot to turn it off and it's my fault. So time for some questions real quick as I, ooh, I got lucky. We'll do questions after that. Come on, give me the options. About 15, 25, there we go. Now we can go back to our particle system. So yeah, looks like I'm gonna have to bring down the threshold a little bit, or bring up the threshold a little bit rather. There we go. Bring it up, up or down. Up, and we get more disconnected shapes, which is what we want. Uh, bring down the number of particles. I call it particles. Let's do this. There we go. Now we'll have stuff that's more disconnected and maybe change the shape up a little bit as well. So we've got really a lot more large and small things. It's doing that thing again, which is incredibly annoying. What happens if I just set my scene settings to one? It seems to be freaking out about something, but I don't know what it is. the texture might be the texture so let's keep that for now but throw it out real quick ooh that's a lot of particles I you know we can just do it like this as well might work out there we go I want to make sure that a lot of this stuff isn't connected so we get a little bit more uh, Little bit more variation within it. it looks like that one might actually work out These bits they're all connected if we do bigger particles and less so I've seen some suggestions pass by but uh, I like doing it like this because it just allows me to go back and experiment with the shape more. So they're all still very much stuck together. So we're looking at it from this angle. That's the thing with metaballs, they like to stick together. So. Oh man, seriously? This then maybe. I think that might work a little bit better. And then I'm just going to play with the seed until I get a layout that looks a bit more full and interesting from this camera angle. Oh, and one thing I forgot to do is in uh, this one we're going to use the count so i know um m ball and m ball one that's the sphere in the cube we're going to put more of those in um so there's more of them than the, than the sticks basically and that gives it breaks it up a little bit more um but we can basically say we want more of these to be in so it's not just all the sticks maybe just three is fine Again, it's to break up the shape a little bit more, see what we can do. Almost there. Let's see what happens if we mess with the seed again. That was kind of fun, but 
Ooh, I like this thing here in the front. That's kind of funny. What happens if we move the camera over a little bit? Ah, so a local view. Put that thing in the middle. It's kind of fun. So we have sort of a center point. It's not perfect, but it could work. We still have this huge mesh in the back. We can use to fill up all our gaps. No, that could work. All right, let's see if we can export this. And if it exports properly, that would be nice. Um, save it and up the resolution. And then I'll answer some questions real quick while this is exporting and things. So, um, have you managed to create organic shapes with meta balls? Um, I mean, yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. It's just that the, as you might have seen, the geometry isn't great. Now, I guess you could remesh that and then start sculpting on top. Uh, another tool I generally use is the skin modifier for organic stuff. So um, here I'll show you real quick. No, uh, Blender, and you can do this in any version. So I'm just going to create a plane, go into edit mode, and I'm going to collapse all of these down. So I just have a single vertex. And then when you add a skin modifier, what you can do is if I extrude this vertex, you'll see it creates uh, extra shapes. So as long as that vertex is selected, I can extrude it, extrude it, extrude it. And then if you hit control A, you can choose the size of that vertex uh, in the skin. And again, if I'm gonna add something like a subdivision surface modifier on here, instead of the smooth shading, you can sort of live edit uh, these really weird things. So you make this really weird tree. Now there are some limitations to it. If you've got a really sort of intricate network, then it, yeah, it'll start breaking up a little bit. So you have to finagle it a little bit to get it to look right. But this does produce quite nice geometry. If we look at the wireframe here, you see it's, it's actually fairly decent. It's not perfect, but it's a little bit better than uh, what the uh, skin mod uh, the um, Metal balls do so. Generally, I, I use this one as well um, for more uh, organic-like stuff. But you can create a tree with this, like a tree branch or a tree trunk, really easily. And you can see as I taper this off. And the cool thing is because it's just a modifier, you can add modifiers on top of it. So you could smooth this out and really get an interesting look with it. And because the the topology isn't the worst in the world, you could add. Bit more subdivision to it and maybe even a displace uh, some kind of weird texture make sure it's not going too nuts and now you've got a weird looking alien cactus and we didn't really have to do a lot of work for that and the fun thing is that it remains completely editable so if you turn on this toggle here you'll see the final uh, final shape so I can keep editing this and kind of keep going with it as much as I want. Um, and it's kind of switch in between. You can also do branching. So you can have multiple vertices coming from one branch as well, which is uh, really nice. And again, if we tone this down, bring this up, kind of live editing this weird looking thing. Um, so yeah, you can go all kinds of ways with this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I would recommend looking into those because you can, you can really, really try some cool stuff out with it. And the reason why it looked a little bit different in edit mode is because we didn't set up the smooth as well either. So there we go. Now we've got, God knows what that's supposed to be. Um, but yeah, that one uh, and Meta Balls are the two best ones I've found for doing organic stuff mainly. Um, some more questions real quick. So this is set, I'm gonna export this and here's to hoping uh, it won't jump. Oh, well. 
Um, can instance metaballs on a plane? Yep, yeah. you can just uh, do the same thing. Um, you can either use instancing from the object menu on the side here, or you can use particles, both works. Um, and then when you animate the plane with like a displace or something, you get really trippy effects. So uh, that's kind of fun. Okay, so the audio didn't change. That's good to know. <laughs> The colors are indeed very trippy. <laughs> um, so this was asks the volume about the volume absorption shader to get more red in the glass. Do you set it to absorb instead of reflect blues? I understand how this works in real life. Just confirming that was what you just did. Yeah. So what it's doing is, uh, um, if you the color that you set in the absorption, it's going to absorb that light. So it's going to turn that. Uh, it's going to let the others pass through and keep whatever the color that you set. So if you want it more red, you just need to use red. So it's quite intuitive to use, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> So, hi, back sky. <laughs> uh, wouldn't have guessed there's so much depth to the scene based on the render angle and focal length. Um, yeah, the, I wanted to create like a crazy pattern and uh, just kind of see what happened. This is already exported. This could be a good thing. Set this back to 1.5 so it doesn't slow everything down. Hiding these meta balls is slow for some reason. I'll have to look into that. Um, so let's import our OBJ. Let's go back to the main screen. Um, somebody said limited dissolve and knife tool and just laser cut through the middle. Yeah, I could have done that. Um, but then you get these hard cuts and I want to kind of hide them in the little nooks and crannies of where the things come together. So I was searching for places that you can't really see from the camera view uh, in the hope that would work better. But I think our shader is going to work better now anyway. So come on, I'm going to keep the show going. I'm going to drink some water while this imports. Let's see. And let's give it the same shader. I believe it was default obj.001. There we go. And now you'll see we get more variation. So it was worth it going back and uh, setting it up properly. The only thing I'm kind of trying to see now. Yeah. So what I am going to do is throw on a smooth modifier just to get re rid of these funky normals. And you'll see that just helps it out a little bit. It changes the shape of the mesh slightly, but I'm not too bothered by that. And now we can really start having fun. Um, so let's add in the glass here. Let's up the roughness just a touch for the rest so it differentiates itself. And let's start messing with subsurface. So, let's see. I don't think I need to do any volume absorption for these, but what I am going to do is start changing these colors because I'm not a huge fan. He says, and then goes back to the red that I was using earlier. Maybe pink on this one. Bring down the metallic a little bit. Bring it up, rather. Nope. Could be kind of fun. So we can see our background poking through again. So let's see if we can move this over. Try and hide the background somehow.
Did I scale it up just a little bit more? No, I just that little teensy. Such a ghetto way of doing it, but just trying to preserve a little bit of extra background feel to it. Let's see if I turn this 90 degrees, if the patterns line up a little bit better. And this is just generally how I work in my spare time because I, I could kind of switch off my brain a little bit and just experiment and have fun. If you're working on commercial stuff all day, then it's uh, you're kind of doing what other people want you to do, which is fine for the most part, but um, it's good to be able to switch off every now and then. If I scale it back down, would that help? Nope. What if we go really big? That's too big. Now we'll just solve it with a good old plane in the back. I don't want to waste everybody's time for too long, so. give it a bit of a texture behind it so it doesn't look completely out of place. Overdo this. Interesting. Did I mess up the scale? No, I didn't. There we go. So now this has got some movement in the background as well, just in case uh, you can see it poking through and it will look completely off. And as long as we give it the same texture or a shader, we should be fine. So I'm just making sure all of them have the right shader. Yep. Now we can keep going. This is definitely not the best one I've done so far. The other ones uh, worked out a little bit better. Let's mess with the scale again. Uh, now we're getting somewhere. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Let's see. Nope, the top and bottom is definitely nice. Maybe a little bit less red. So it's cool because now our glass is sort of picking up the yellow and uh, green at the bottom, but the overall image is more red and blue, which is kind of cool. What happens if we up the distortion? So just changing these values changes everything drastically. It was kind of nice the way it was. There we go. And now we've got something to work from. So sometimes overdoing it doesn't always work. Sometimes keeping it chill works a little bit better. That's kind of fun. Pink, red, and blue. What happens if we up the metallic a little bit? Oh, we're getting somewhere on this one. Up 
So if we add another color in the mix here. Let's keep that one white, see what that does. Is the subsurface helping? That does give it a sort of a softer feel. So if we increase the radius, change the color a little bit. that maybe more orange no now the colors on this one are starting to look pretty nice Let's see render it real quick So, have I tried any other render engines besides Evian Cycles like LuxCore, Octane, Radeon Pro Render, etc.? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I've used other renders before. I switched to Blender, so I used um, Mental Ray, V Ray, and Corona back in the day. Um, I've tried Octane for Blender once or twice, but only very limited, so I'm not the right, right person to ask uh, anything about it. Um, I'm interested to see if Redshift could be a, a good tool. Um, I hear that's been coming to Blender or is coming to Blender. Um, LuxCore I've tried, it's cool. Uh, but um, it, it integrates really nicely because it's open source, so it integrates just as well as, uh, as Cycles, which is cool. Um, but I'm so used to Cycles at this point that uh, I'm just going to keep using that for now. Um, trying to think I tried the radio pro render once or twice but it installs so much extra stuff and I just never really got a good good result from it um, so I kind of gave up on it a little bit but I should try it again because I've heard it's gotten a lot better um, but I just haven't tried it in quite a while so um, but yeah I, I use different stuff sometimes but cycles is just so nicely integrated into blender that um, I tend to use it. Uh, I've tried eCycles as well, which is very fast, um, but I got like the 2019 update, so I have to pay for all the new updates again now, and it's a little bit on the expensive side, I find. Um, it's comparable to some other renderers, but in my mind, uh, they're kind of building on cycles and all the work that's been done, so it's a bit much for me for, for an upgrade. Um, and I like to use all the daily builds and stuff. So that's generally why I just stick to cycles. It just looks great. Um, then, uh, yeah, I, was, I totally lost my train of thought there. But yeah, I mean, I use different things, but mostly, like I said, mostly just cycles. But I've tried, I try different ones because they're fun. Um, there's so many weird esoteric, uh, render engines out there that you can just kind of keep going. So I'll answer the uh, color management question in a little bit. I'm just going to try and see what we can do with this here. So let's load in the render. I'm going to collapse these down a little bit so we have a bit more space to work with for compositing. Oh, and I forgot one thing. Let's see if I can show it here. Where is my mist? Yeah, I'm going to set up my mist pass a little bit better. So let's have it start around there. And that's the fun thing about the mist pass is you can visualize it. So it's up the depth to about there. So we've got our whole scene incorporated. There we go. And re render that. So I will answer your. Uh, color management question. Um, so to repeat the question, any thoughts on color management? Recently I've been trying to wrap my head around this. Do you work with different display transforms like Rec 709? So color management has become a really hot topic. Uh, always has been incredibly important, but has become kind of a hot topic lately, which I think is good. Um, the thing is, it is it does take a little while to wrap your head around it. So um, I'm not the perfect person to ask. I used to be on top of things, but I uh, I kind of let my knowledge slip. 
a little bit, um, but there's a website called HT, hg2dc.com, I believe, and that's the Hitchhiker's Guide to Digital Color. So um, every now and then, if you go to the menu, uh, this basically starts at the beginning. So uh, yeah, the, the language is a little, <laughs> a little rough, um, but this is written by Troy Swalka, who uh, wrote Filmic Transform for Blender in the beginning. And he's a digital color expert, and he basically explains you the whole idea of how it all works. So um, it's best to start from uh, from the beginning and read through this. Now, this is very technical, so it might not be, you know, it might be a bit much the first time you read it, um, but it takes a little while to get used to all this stuff. So it's, uh, but it, it explains to you how all the different colors work and everything, and it's well worth a, a read. Uh, even if you don't understand everything, you'll take a lot away from it. Generally, um, display transforms i uh it depends on the project if color uh, clients ask for certain things then in a composite piece a compositing package for example you might load in a lot of theirs that messes with your display transform but like i said um in my personal work i usually just use it to artistic effect i kind of push colors a little bit further than they should and um, it's not always 100% correct, but I kind of like that at the same time. So uh, I hope that kind of answers your question. But this website, uh, HG2DC, and it's basically the Hitchhiker's Guide to Digital Color is what it stands for. Um, it, it This will explain everything you ever want to know, basically. Um, and yeah, it's a little strongly worded sometimes, but that's okay. Uh, it's good to uh, it's good to just kind of read through. It's a whole whole bag of worms, I guess, if you want to call it that. But if you have an understanding of it, then you know what you're doing right, or in some cases, what you can do wrong for artistic effect, which I think is equally as important. Um, before you start breaking the rules, you kind of need to learn learn them first. Um, anyways, I, I've always been in that mindset. So technical, but very interesting. All right, so let's go to our compositor here. Use nodes, uh, and I'm gonna denoise the image in a little bit. Actually, I'll do it now. So if you're gonna use the denoiser, use these three, plug them in, and that's all you need to do. And whoop, denoised. Now, I don't know how much denoising we needed. A fair amount. I don't know how visible that is on the stream, but there we go. Uh, and let's start mixing in some other stuff. So let's add our mist pass. Uh, filter, no, what am I doing? Um, adding in a color ramp, plugging in the mist. And if we just look at the mist itself, then we can get an idea of what it looks like. So we can kind of set our in and out points. I tend to use the B spline a lot because I've set my mist pass here to be a linear fall off. So that way I can re sort of recurve it any way I want uh, with the B spline method here. So there we go, and we're gonna add that in. Nope, not the viewer, but the output. There we go. And now it's just a case of looking to see how much mist we want and which color we want it. So this works really well to separate the background out a little bit and just give it a little bit more depth. Ooh, that orange really, really helped. That's nice. That gives it just a little bit more pop, but... So now we've got a more interesting sort of looking image. And maybe we could even overdo that. So one of the things that, for example, Filmic does, uh, the Filmic Color Transform, I'm going to set this to high contrast because high contrast is preferable. Well, at least I like it better. Let me put it that way. Um, let's see if the curves work on this one. They do. So the curves that I'm using here, they're actually part of your view transform. So generally you'd want to do curves in the compositor, but the reason I use them here is because they uh, update instantly the moment you let them go. So you can very quickly see what's going on. 
Let's see. Uh, the red's okay. Pull out maybe some of the green. That's cool. What happens if we take out the blue and then the red becomes a little bit more visible, but I want to keep those purplish things. There we go. Let's see how much effect that has. And it just gives it overall a little bit more punch. Although maybe the green. Yeah, it's kind of cool as well. Maybe separate out the background just a bit more. Bring that shader in here. There we go. I really like this orange bit down here. That kind of brings it together. So what do we have? This is kind of okay, but I feel like there might be a little bit too much blue in the shader still. So let's see if we can go back. Let's just hit save real quick so we can always reopen the file if we don't like the changes we made. Let's go back to our object here. Let's maybe tone down the blue a little bit. We bring in a little bit more white. Ah, but the white is reflecting blue light as well, so that's probably it. And we're kind of okay, actually. I'm trying to get bit of a balance in there. So I definitely want that front one here. Let's see if we move the camera over a little bit. Mm, not really doing much. Maybe down a little bit. This feels like a better center point. Maybe down a little bit more. I don't know if we're at the edge of the mesh there. We might be, but that's kind of cool. Yeah, that might be better even. Let's compare real quick. How does this feel in comparison? Actually, this felt kind of nice. Although, just having a little bit more of this here does help, I find. I would even move it over a little bit more, just to get the weight of that sorted out. It's all these small changes, just trying to get the image to feel a bit more correct. So we've still got that orange spot down here, but that's not going to be as crazy. Let's see. You can always go back. Let's see. You know, it's interesting how the world texture is giving like a free light dispersion illusion. Yeah, that um, it's definitely good for that. World texture is uh, very underrated. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. There's a lot of red in the middle. I might want to take that out a little bit. But we'll see. I really like the contrast these white ones give with the red ones and the blue ones over here. But even within these crazy patterns, I'm trying to find like almost like a center line where it feels a little bit more stable and not as crazy. And again, we're looking at like crazy psychedelic trippy, uh, trippy images, I guess. So there's only so much one can do. All right, almost there. Go, go, gadget compositing. There we go. It is quite an assault on the senses. 
Yeah, the blue definitely helped there. No, it's not better. This one feels a little bit better than the other one. It's too red. All right, let's open up number four again because we saved it right before we did all the changes. Oh, no, wrong one. What I am going to do is move the camera over just slightly. Although this is a really great sort of center of attention. No, I might just stick with it. And it feels a bit more balanced, this in the middle. This one's a bit big, but it's not the end of the world. This is still a fairly decent centerpiece. No, let's leave it like that. Changes aren't always better. Let's try and figure out the final compositing and then uh, we're almost done. And I'll show you one more cool thing that I, uh, I was working on um, that otherwise won't see the light of day as a bit of a thank you for sticking with me to the end. Well, you can do it, computer. Actually, I'll show you right now. No point in waiting on this um, project. So unfortunately, we had to cancel our conference due to the current situation, but it is what it is. Um, but I was working on opening titles, and this was kind of a fun shot that I ended up creating recently. So this is all Eevee, even. I was trying to see if I could do it uh, in Eevee kind of push it and see how far it would go and this was definitely one of the the more fun shots that I created it's a little bit long but I really like this first sort of opening so this is all in camera basically there's very little compositing done to this except for some color correction and uh, some mist here at the top everything else is just uh, in camera so I animated the lights in Eevee and it gives this really cool effect now uh, with the logo I really like the way these these wrinkles on the side uh, did what they did so um, I can show you real quick how I ended up oh, how I ended up doing that and it's a shame some of this stuff won't uh, we won't end up using this but these things happen so let's see I'll show you live so you can see here that it is in fact just Eevee And I was using a different version, so I need to open it with the right version. Let's hope it works in this one. Why is it broken? Ah, I was working before. This is a result of working with, um, ah, there we go. Now it should be all right. Sometimes you get some weirdness if you work with these development versions, but here you can see it in the viewport live. So that's how quick it renders. Um, doing this stuff in Eevee is super cool. And especially in 2.83, now that they've added passes, you can just output all the passes and composite everything back uh, together and have even more control, so. That's really nice and really fun. To give you a very quick idea of how this was set up. Obviously, uh, it's a cloth simulation. Uh, and uh, just these particles are just some dust particles. So I'm going to turn those off real quick. Um, there we go. So this one has, uh, yeah, I exported it. So turn off the sim. So basically, there's just some turbulence to give that effect towards the end over even though I'm not a big fan I was gonna cut it off fairly early but it's good to know how the uh, cloth sim here what it looks like so let's see so whenever I'm doing cloth simulations I tend to set the uh, these ones over here the tension compression shear bending uh, both in the stiffness and damping very low and then you get cloth that gets really flexible and stretchy 
So for this one, what I did is actually animated this thing coming up into it. And there's a vertex group, just to quickly explain it. There's a vertex group um, that that's one for smoothing afterwards. And this one is just the edges that I've selected and they're pinned. So that way the edges will always stay in the same place and you can just uh, explore doing weird stuff with the middle of the, the mesh. And uh, the cool thing is that if we look at the cloth simulation again, what I did is I ended up uh, animating the speed multiplier. If we can show it here, it should show up, but it's a little bit on the slow side. Come on. Now it's a fairly high, uh, high resolution mesh though. So. There we go. What you can see is that uh, as the thing is starting to protrude, oh, it's trying to, god dang it. I'm gonna turn it off real quick, just so you can see the keyframes. So as the uh, this object is protruding, I'll turn off the cough, the other one. Um, I basically turn down the speed, so I animate the speed multiplier down, so it gives this nice sort of uh, slow down effect as it's coming up and um, same thing with the pressure as it comes up animate the pressure on negative so it sucks in the mesh around that thing and that's how you get that final sort of result um, but yeah, I wanted to show that as well because uh, like I said it's probably not going to be shown anywhere else so it's just a fun sort of thing and then when you scroll through it you see you get that sort of initial push and you can see that I only animate the lights uh, as the uh, as the object has come up through it, so you can only see it from the beginning here. And then as that pushes through, sort of slows down, and you get these nice sort of wrinkles for free. And you get all these kinds of wrinkles um, not only because there's a little bit of turbulence, but because all of this stuff is turned down and the cloth starts folding in and over itself, and it looks really really cool. So that was that for that shot. Um, yeah. Did I turn off the dust as well? I think I did, but it doesn't really matter. But yeah, it's cool. This kind of stuff is uh, is really fun to work on. But it just goes to show that you can do cool stuff with the EV as well that looks extremely cinematic. It's just down to your colors and, and how you light stuff. And this is lit very fairly simply. So if we go at the bottom here and just look at it, I don't know why the dust is visible all of a sudden, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's really just three lights. So this main one in the back here is providing all the really interesting reflections. And these two on the side are just giving it uh, that bit extra, just highlighting the shape. And all of them have just been animated to, uh, to turn on and off. So here you see it from a different angle. You can see it from the top. And there's a volume, uh, there's some volumetrics in the world thing as well, just to get that little bit of mist on top. But here you'll see them animate and you'll see the whole thing. So, and the, uh, the lights, the uh, pink ones are animated just to move up a little bit, just to give it a little bit extra. So then when you look at the final shot, the volumetrics just give it a little bit more depth. And then when you play it again, you'll see uh, see that slowdown sort of happening, even though it's not really playing real time, but yeah. That's cool. You can do uh, cool stuff with it. All right, so back to what we were doing. And I think we're pretty much there. Increasing the contrast definitely helps with making it a bit more legible. Maybe bring in a little bit more of that orange. Let's see what happens if we overdo it. And it makes it a little less chaotic, which is nice. There we go. And one of the things I always like to do is just sharpen the image and then uh, bring it back down a little bit. So we're gonna throw in two filter filters. But that just gives it a little bit more. So the reason I do this is if you look at something like a DSLR, like a, a 
uh, image, sorry, an image taking, taken with a camera, it always has sort of a little bit of sharpening going on on the edges. And I always want to make these things feel like somehow they've been photographed and it just helps just that ever so little. I don't know how visible it is on the, uh, on the stream, but it's just that little bit even yeah, you don't really see it that much. But like I said, I render these things huge, so the uh, the final step would really be rendering that separately. A bit more green, maybe. And it's just subtle tweaks. The curves do help. The green just makes it a little bit more inviting. I think that's it for this one. Um, I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? Yeah, we can throw in some more saturation, but these are things you're not sp supposed to be doing. If you want to like, do things right with the compositor, you can see this does horrible, horrible things to the colors, because this is not really a correct node. It's not really doing the right uh, color transform or anything. But that would be about it. Looks like it. I'll try one last thing and then uh, it's time for some more questions so if you have some final questions you want to ask now would be the moment to uh, start asking them so before i want this one before the other one it's going to reuse that same color wrap but i'm going to flip it set this to 100 percent white and add this in here as well so what this does is, uh, if I multiply it, I can actually make all the other ones in the back darker and less, uh, and somewhat less reflective. So they're going to turn orange more because we've got our mist, but it could help in just bringing them down a little bit. There we go. Maybe I want the front ones not to be affected too much. There we go. I don't know how much it does, but yeah, it just gives it a tiny bit more depth, which helps. There we go. Sharpening might be a bit much. All right, I think uh, I'm going to call it on this one. So yeah, last bit of curves. Yeah, taking out the red does help because it's a little bit too red. There we go. And all that's left to do is just render it. So generally, I'll render these at 8-ish K, so 300%. So this is going to be 78 60 by 78 60 and then I upscale them a tiny tiny bit for print because um, you don't really see it that much at that kind of resolution so uh, that's it all I would do now is hit render and uh, and save it when it's done so there you go that's a process for one of these from start to finish which is kind of cool um, yeah Whew, how long have we been going? Two hours and 18 minutes. Okay, not as long as I thought it would be, but still uh, <laughs> significant. So yeah, if you've got any last questions, um, feel free to ask. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. I hope you're all staying safe and you're able to, uh, to at least try and enjoy your time inside a little bit, uh, even though, you know, it's a weird, uh, weird situation right now everywhere. But um, yeah. That's about it. So last question, uh, Ruth Lukas, Metaballs? Yes, indeed, Metaballs. Um, yeah, the stream has gone through the entire image. So if you want to see how to do it from start to finish, uh, I start from scratch and create everything from scratch. So yeah, you'll probably be seeing this one on social media in the coming days. Um, that's about it. Not seeing any questions anymore. So uh, I'm going to finish it off. So thanks everyone for joining. Have uh, have a nice day, stay safe, and um, yeah, I'm sure we'll do another stream fairly soon. So, see you later. Bye. <laughs>